partner and a co-founder of, of a startup that is in of a uh, VC that is in stealth. So our name is not stealth, but we are in stealth. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to CMU TNE Startup School. Today's course is how to pitch and aim to, how to pitch to angels and VCs. I would encourage you to check your course schedules. If you're in the wrong classroom, this is your last chance to get up and leave. No questions asked. Um, but very seriously, I'm joined this, this afternoon by three pretty amazing CMU alumni, Eleanor Hagland, Ed Angler, and Vikram Chatterjee. And together we span about four decades of CMU from the 1980s to the 2010s and have over 40 years of startup fundraising and investing experience as well as being founders ourselves. Um, I'm gonna kick things off, let everyone introduce themselves and Vikram, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna channel my inner investor for a second and just ask you, what do you do and why should it matter to us? Thanks, Carl. Um, so really quick, I'm Vikram. I'm a co-founder of a company called Galileo. And before Galileo, I was leading product management at Google for about six years. Um, really quick about Galileo as well and what I do. So the, the 2010s were about all about software and mobile applications, but uh, it's pretty clear that the 2020s, this entire decade is going to be about ML applications. But, and data is the lifeblood of machine learning, but there is almost no way of knowing as an ML engineer, whether you're actually dealing with good quality data or not. And we face this a lot at Google, uh, my co-founder at Uber. And so what we're doing with Galileo, we're aiming to solve uh, for that problem of identifying good quality data for machine learning for the millions of ML engineers across the world. Awesome, awesome. Eleanor, let me turn to you. Tell us what we need to know about you before we jump into tonight's discussion. Sure. Thanks, Carl. Hi, everyone. Um, Eleanor here. It's a pleasure to, to meet you all and, and to be here on this panel today. Um, I'm the CEO of Aspire360, and our mission is to help early stage founders um, avoid the minefield that is starting your own business. Um, so we help pre-seed to Series A founders um, navigate their fundraising, their sales and marketing, product market fit, leadership management, all of that. Um, we've been around for a couple of years and have helped a lot of founders um, do that. So that's me. Awesome. Thanks, Eleanor. And you're a serial entrepreneur yourself. So a serial founder. I want to just highlight that. And last but not least, hi, Ed. Hi, Carl. Uh, can good you to see you. Us, so good, good to, to be too. here. It's great to have you. And can you give us your elevator pitch about what makes you a credible expert on this topic tonight? Sure, sure. Well, uh, I, I came out of CMU in the 80s, like the old times. And uh, then I spent a lot of time developing technology because that's fun. And then I figured out you really have to sell it. Otherwise, you don't get to keep your job. So then I kind of turned to selling technology. And now uh, working on my second, no, maybe third fund in the venture side, I've you know, kind of got a proven model around B2B SaaS investing where you can connect to the market relatively easily before you have to make huge investments in technology. And that makes the, the whole journey more fun for everybody. So uh, that's kind of the journey I've had the last 20 years and uh, I'm happy to say, ready to share it with the rest and make some money all around. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. I'm gonna, we're going to stay with you for a second. And just so we're all on the same page, could you kick us off with some definitions? Like, Just be clear, who are angel investors and venture capitalists and what are their key differences? And I think you may, have, you may wear both, both hats sometimes. Yeah, that's a great question, Carl. And having been both over time or maybe at the same time, it's, uh, it's a, a, a little bit fuzzy. Super angels are, are, may have more assets and ability to invest in micro VCs. So I think you'll, you'll see the two classes kind of overlap to some degree. And, um, and really there's with eight or nine or 10 different sources of capital if you count them up. So there's really a wide variety of places to get money. But let's, let's call angels uh, individuals that make decisions by themselves. They don't collaborate with big groups. They don't have an investment committee. They might have to convince a spouse, and uh, but that usually is, is is a relatively lightweight process. Now, super angels can get pretty sophisticated in their due diligence and such, but um, 
that's that's kind of one category. The second category would be angel groups. This is kind of like institutional angels. It's maybe the little tweeners there. And then you have the VCs, even if they're small funds, what characterizes them is that you have some general partners choosing what the investments are going to be, even while they represent a small portion of the of the of the capital that they're investing in. Um, the angels and angel groups are all investing their own capital. So that's another major difference. Maybe I'll stop there and see if there's questions or well, I guess I on. mean oftentimes a lot of a lot of startups also start kind of even before the angel, just to mention it, you know, in that family and friend space. And can you just talk about that? Because a lot of people that are just getting going. I think yeah, that's a great point, Carl. And, and in fact, if you look at all these varied sources of capital, they kind of come in a series. Almost no company just has one source of capital, right? You might start with grants or most likely bootstrapping, right? And friends and family, to your point, just people who know and trust you and are willing to support you in whatever crazy adventure you're going after. Um, and then the other great place to target is people who really understand this pain you're solving in the market. And if they've made any mar any money, you know, if they're retired or recently exited a business that's adjacent or in the same space, they may be very interested in investing in that opportunity to fix that pain they're so familiar with. And then the VCs really just are a bunch of lemmings. Honestly, they kind of look for companies with a million plus in revenue and a certain growth path and a certain size market and a certain pedigree. And they're really the rocket fuel that takes a company that's been able to get a good start and really get it up to something large. Because um, at, at the end of the day, growing companies soak up a lot of cash and a lot of talent. And uh, those are things that VCs bring to the table. Awesome. You talked about rocket fuel. And Vikram, I know you and I have talked about this before. A lot of people think about investors as just this rocket fuel, just a source of capital. But uh, there's a lot of other things, a lot of other roles that, that uh, investors can, can play with a startup. Can you talk about that, about this founder investor fit and why it's so important? Sure. So um yeah finding the right investor is super important some people talk about it almost as if you're hiring an investor i don't think of it exactly the same way but um an investor first of all if you're talking about venture capital they'll likely be a board member as well so they're with you by your side forever so it's a and a company is not a short-term gig it's a it, you have to think of it as a many decades long activity right and so you, this is a person who's with you for the next 50 to 60 years that's just the way i think about it um, so it's, it's very important. Just, that's a very important decision. And the tricky part is that when you're raising capital, it's, it's, it's a point in time activity, but once you're done with that, you are both stuck with each other for a long, long time. And so you have to be very careful about how you, how you choose your investor. And there are a couple of different things to think about there because, uh, you know, first of all, an investor, for instance, who primarily invests in consumer and community products might not be useful if you're building out some kind of a top-down sales driven enterprise business. Um, so overall, just to, uh, uh, just to keep this uh, framed in terms of what I think is most useful to think about when looking for investors, I think of three things. Number one is they will help you uh, with the right kind of connections at the right time, just because they are in that right space. Uh, number two, they should be able to ask the right questions and not act as operators. So you have to kind of keep that in mind as well. And number three, they really believe in the way you think about the world and how it's going to change and, and will always be by your side throughout the process. So you kind of have to check for all of those things, but it's a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a quick story about one of your key investors that you found, how you found them, how you guys got connected, maybe in like the earliest stage of your current company, Galileo? Yeah, so for, for me, it was, I don't know if every story is so different, but for me, it was it was born out of some insights that I saw at Google while I was working there. And then my co-founder was leading machine learning at Uber. Um, and we um, started really going down this rabbit hole of why are why is no one thinking about data when data is a big part of machine learning? Everyone's thinking about the model. And that went into looking into research, getting connected to the right folks. And that led us to talking to some professors at Stanford, some other experts in the field. And it just so happened that a bunch of those people whom we were talking to anyways for months brought a fund together at just the right, just around the time. And we were thinking of 
um, of fundraising ourselves. And it so serendipitously just worked out with them. And so we, we, we went with them because they were advisors to us, so to speak, already. They knew us really well. And most importantly, they were experts in the field and they believed in this whole notion that uh, that uh, that uh, developer tools for machine learning, especially this view of data centric machine learning is gonna be the next wave, uh, just like we did. And uh, uh, so we were intellectually on the right path together, as well as uh, from the from a perspective of, uh, of uh, how to manage capital. They, they had done that before as well, which is important. You don't wanna go with somebody who has never been an investor before um, because they might be, they might get to micromanage you, which you don't want when you're building a company. Yeah. You, you did highlight an, on a really important point, which is it's about relationships. You know, this is a relationship game and you can call it a game, but it's a long-term set of relationships and how you work the network. You just talked about that. I mean, you worked yourself into a network and through the working of that network, other relationships emerged and then there was alignment and then you could confirm and you knew enough about these people that you wanted to welcome them into your long-term relationship. I, I actually think about it a little like a little bit like a marriage um, and it can go really badly or it can go really well, right? Um, so I'm turning to you for a second, Eleanor. Now you're a serial entrepreneur. You've raised a bunch of money, a lot of early stage, and now you're in on kind of the other side of like maybe the the three three legs of a of this kind of conversation. Um, you coach CM. You coach CEOs, uh, particularly startup CEOs at Aspire 360. In your role and with all the coaches that you're working with, this network of coaches around the United States and many of them CMU alum. What are the things that you're finding that founders are missing when they're when they're doing their pitch, when they're building their pitch? Started to move into this kind of pitch conversation. What's what's missing in that conversation? Yeah, I mean, it's it's usually a couple of things, but the thing that I see most often is um, that founders haven't yet kind of tried to interact with the market in a meaningful way. So they try and go to investors first as that kind of validation of their company. And I know because I've I've been there, I've done that. It's kind of like when I get angel investment or when I get VC investment, I'll have a real company. And so a lot of folks start from that place. Um, but the, the way that I've seen founders actually be most successful in their, in their fundraising um, rounds is actually to interact with the market, try and like do a lot of tests, really try and actually get those first customers, learn how to, how to sell those first customers, and then go to the VC and say, I do have a process. I have actually talked to the people that I believe that I can sell to. And then the VCs and the and angels are gonna have so much more confidence in the, in the founder and what they're saying and in their ability to execute because they've kind of already de-risked a lot of the things that an investor might be worried about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk more about this understanding the, the customer side of it and what is, you know, where do, we, where do they get, where do founders get hung up in that space? Um, I've, I've seen them get hung up in like, talk, like either not wanting to talk to customers because then they could kind of like blow up the, the dream um, or, or you might hear something that you might not want to hear um, or like actually genuinely talking to folks, but then not really accepting their answers. So like asking pointed questions, like, here's my product. Do you like it? And like, no one's going to say that they don't like your product. They, they love you. They, they think you're a nice person. They, they just want you to be happy. And so I think like figuring out how to ask the right questions and then how to validate that is crucial. Um, and, and it is a skill that can be learned. Um, so it's, it's not the end of the world if, if they're, if you don't know how to do that yet, or if you haven't tried that's awesome. Thanks, Eleanor. Yeah. Ed, um, as CMU alum, you know, and I think it ties into this issue about talking to customers. Like, do we want to get out from behind our computers? You know, we love tech. And I know you, you know, you're a SCS grad or pre-SCS, you know, math, that math CS grad. You know, we, we breathe, we sleep, we dream tech at CMU. And we're, we're leading, you know, we're leading tech builders, you know, and you were a leading tech builder for decades. But as an investor, what's often missing when tech dominates the startup pitch you know when you hear someone come to you as an investor and they're coming to you and just pushing the tech side what what's missing there yeah that's a great question carl i'm gonna go back to you know what eleanor said is have they engaged the market uh you know and i, I actually taught entrepreneurship in the school of engineering uh for five years so to technologists and it's not that hard in 15 weeks you can learn how to 
have a balanced company. And the balance is between building and sales and marketing. And it turns out that, that you can innovate and iterate on both sides. And so it's really easy to iterate and keep building on your technology, but until you go engage the market and get the feedback, you're, you, you don't really, you can't really iterate on your marketing message to any benefit. And so you have to go out there and listen to those people. And fortunately, we have some amazing programs like i and, uh, uh, you know. Venture Bridge. Yeah. Product, yeah, Venture Bridge that get people to listen to the customers. And that's so valuable because it turns out after having spent millions of dollars building technology, that was so cool. It was unbelievable. But then no one wanted to buy it. It is so painful. So now you have to look for somebody with a pain and a checkbook and then build the technology that they need, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, a different way of thinking. You see a lot of deals come across your desk, Ed, you know, on a weekly basis. What are some of the key metrics you're looking for that are just in your own thesis for investment, but that might give folks an idea of kind of, you know, what are the things that some investors are looking for? Well, I'm a, I'm a little bit of an outlier, Carl, but most investors are looking for ARR and ARR growth and almost nothing else. Well, that's not true. That's what, define, that's what, oh, ARR, uh, and, uh, and, annual recurring revenue. This is in mm -hmm. particular in software or things that have very high margins, tech enabled services or patentable technology devices where you can get 70, 80, 90% margins on what you're selling. That's kind of what characterizes it. And that you have a market big enough and that you can find enough prospects that you can get really get that revenue curve growing. When you really get that revenue curve growing, that's when you see valuations going from 50 to 100 to 200 million to a billion dollars in a matter of months or a year or two. It's all about that revenue growth. And it turns out that revenue growth is not about technology. It's usually about the sales team or the marketing engine and both of them together and good enough technology that doesn't break. Right. And that's that's the, the, the key combination for getting the VCs interested. And I exactly. think I'll take a let me just take a little uh, digression here, because to get angels interested, you don't need metrics or numbers. You need emotional connection. You need them to be connected to that pain and your purpose and what you believe, just like Vikram was saying earlier. That's that's the way to get angels. Now, Vikram, uh, just shifting to you for a second. You've had some success in raising both from angels and, and I think also now in the VC space. How, how important has it been for you to be customer centric when you've been making your case to investors? Uh, so I, I think in general, customer centricity is critical for the business, not just for investor pitching. And it is like even before we put a single line of code down, we spoke to at least 100 machine learning engineers across the world over three months. Like that was that is all we did. And um, you learn so much about things because it's not just about finding a problem. It's about finding a problem that someone's willing to actually pay a lot of money for. So uh, until you're completely sure about that in your gut, you just don't start anything. Um, and I think that just translates itself into what the story is and how it's gonna, how the pitch is gonna flow. Um, but when it comes to actually pitching, I feel like there are four big things that you need to keep in mind in general. Uh, one is like, how big is the market today and is it really growing so that it's going to be much, much bigger tomorrow? Uh, the second is how big is this pain for customers and you know what adjacencies, what other markets and what other companies are there? And, why, and the third one is why you and why your team to build it? And the last one is why now uh, in, in the arc of time? Why is it now and how is this going to grow over time? So those are a few things that I keep top of mind constantly, not just for now, but eventually as well. Like as you keep growing, it's constantly important to keep that um, keep that up uh, up your mind. That's fantastic. Is there anything specific that you would point to that you are really proud of in your own pitch that you think helped to drive some of your success in connecting with investors? Um, for for me, honestly, if you, if you uh, if you have personal stories to tell, like I I had I went through the pain myself at Google of of like literally working with my engineers on Google Sheets and trying to figure out what was wrong with my model, which is ridiculous. It's a horrible waste of intellectual capital. Um, and we saw this with all of the folks that we talked to as well. So it was very obvious uh, and that, that, we had to, that we had to do this. My co-founder worked on the early Siri team and he had some horror stories to tell from there as well on the exact same lines. 
Um, so there, it was very obvious when you when you lead with these kinds of personal stories that you felt the pain and you want to solve for that, and you've hired people who felt the pain themselves, um, it it becomes much easier to pitch. And I've seen that stories are a really powerful way of of putting your point across and uh, of convincing people. That's really awesome to think about story because ultimately we're pitching human beings, and while numbers matter they are going to connect into the stories, you know, just like now it's amazing. Every time I listen to the news and there's a huge, big story about, you know, how many thousands of people have been impacted by, you know, the earthquake in Haiti. And yet what do the reporters do? They pick one or two people by name and they tell you their story and what they've experienced to make it connect. You can connect to it. And I think this idea of telling story, it's the same thing, frankly, you're connecting with another human being who has to make a decision. Granted, there's a lot of other hoops they might have you jump through, particularly on the VC side. But I think as Ed was talking about on the angel side, you know, it's really, you know, that's a lot about connecting. How do you connect? And you're also building rapport and relationship too, which is about part of that long-term connection. Is there chemistry, not just relationally, but but, the, but philosophically and value-driven? And I, I want to bring up to all of us to kind of open this up more broadly. This, this kind of ties in in some ways to also the founder's purpose. You know, Vikram, you you had a you have a purpose with Galileo. You had a pain, you experienced it, your partner experienced it. As you talk to engineers around the world who are very much like you in this amazing emerging space of ML. I mean, it's still emerging, but it's obviously been around for a while and exploding, exploding. Um, you know, you heard this pain and you want to solve it. You know, that's your purpose. You got to, you're driven and you're early investors are also driven by that pain too. I want to talk about that and how, um, how, does, how does founder purpose, both from a, just the startup side, how does it, I, I see it, it as kind of the, the thing that keeps people going through the challenging times, just in terms of talking a little bit about the narrative of a startup's life. And I think about it as kind of the fuel that powers a founder, you know, their grit, which is obviously such an important topic and people have been talking about grit. Um, I've also been hearing, and I'm counterpointing that, a lot of investors talk about CEO's coachability. And so this kind of combination of a founder's purpose, their grit, their ability to stay in there in the hard time, are they fueled by a purpose? And then also their coachability. Does An investor doesn't want to invest in somebody and sit on a board with someone who's not going to listen. You know, And so... I just want to bring open that up to everybody. How how can we demonstrate? How can founders demonstrate uh, this purpose and deeper purpose, grit and coachability to investors? Um, Eleanor, can you? Is this how does this resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to let Ed and and Vikram talk about kind of grit and purpose. I know Ed is just kind of the guru on purpose. And I, I really respect him for that. But um, coachability is definitely something that I hear a lot um, from investors about whether or not they're interested in continuing conversations with founders. Um, one of the ways that I've seen founders be really successful in demonstrating their coachability, and I am not advocating for being fake in any way, but genuinely asking questions to these investors who are in many cases experts in the industries or the, or the fields that they are investing in, um, and listening to the answers. And that's not just kind of like nodding and being like, oh yeah, great, thanks so much for sharing, but rather like really trying to take in that information. And you don't have to do everything that they say. You don't have to do anything that they say. Um, but if you can kind of take a little bit of an, a nugget from what they're what they're saying and maybe repeat it back, try and integrate it into the strategy or even just like remind them of that like a couple of weeks later that you did appreciate that they took the time to answer your questions and, and really brainstorm with you. It goes a really long way in, in making you seem like a coachable founder and also in creating a really good relationship because like Vikram said, you're gonna be with these people for a while. Like it, it truly is a marriage, like what Carl said. Ed, you and I have spent, we spent a lot of time talking about purpose recently. What's your perspective on this? How, how do, and how important is that for, for founders to, to share that in their pitch and, and and get that, uh, that connection across to the to the investors. That's a great question, Carl. And I have to say, it varies a lot because people's purpose is very personal and emotional, and their purpose might not align. And this kind of goes to the 
point others have been saying about the importance of picking your investors carefully because it is a marriage and breaking up is messy and expensive. You don't want to do it. So careful who you take your money from. Most importantly, have them share your purpose. But if you can't kind of clarify what it is for yourself, then it's hard to know if other people are aligning on it with you. They might be interested in a CMU related startup and they might have some idea about what that means. And two years down the road, it's not matching that expectation. And so they want to get out. They're upset. They don't want to do it anymore. But getting out after two years is typically not possible, not without misery. So I think that's where the, the importance of purpose alignment comes in is, is the ability to sustain the relationship in long term. Uh, the other uh, two points, grit is critical because it's usually pretty hard to get your startup going and can often be a year, couple years of, of challenging times. Squeezed budgets, undercapitalization, customers that won't call you back. I mean, not customers that won't call you back. And uh, once you get through that, you learn the lessons that you need to unlock scale. And there are, those are many and varied. But uh, once, once you learn those, um, you can achieve scale and make useful, make use of lots of capital. Uh, but there's a bunch of things to learn. And this is kind of where the coachability comes in. Because if you have to learn all the mistakes, you have to make all the mistakes yourself and learn them the hard way, it sure is expensive for us investors. So I look at all these things, especially learning quickly from the mistakes of others so you can avoid them. This is all about IRR and returns and being capital efficient, right? And if you can be thoughtful and consider the possibilities in advance and not have to waste money learning things, then not only do you save investor money, you save yourself dilution. Uh, so that's the, the, the benefits of grit, coachability, and purpose. That's powerful. That's powerful. I, Vikram, actually, we're getting some questions in through Slido, and there's a question for Vikram I want to ask. And I, I just want to remind everybody, I know people have, have entered some things in the chat, but we're going to take all questions through Slido, and there's a link to Slido in the chat. So please put your questions there. Um, so Vikram, a question for you. Uh, I think you've adjusted a little bit, but tell a little bit of your story. How did you convince investors to invest in you at the pre-seed stage? What made VCs believe in you and your team? Um, I think in general, you, I think uh, Eleanor mentioned this a little bit before. Uh, you should think of venture capital or, or any capital from anyone as the last thing you're doing, not the first thing you're doing. And what I mean by that is have leverage before you have that conversation with someone, ha know what the problem is, maybe even have some kind of a prototype or a demo, have had con customer and user conversations are free. Um, just do as much of the free stuff as you possibly can with your time. Um, and, and then once you have conviction, then you go towards the right people um, and the right people being you research them, you look at what the past investments are, what their interest areas are. And then if you were going there with the right, again, with the right story and the right problem, uh, ideally with some uh, customers who can back you up, because the first question is going to be, why are you doing this? What are you doing? Why now? And then once they're convinced that they see a prototype, they want a couple of phone numbers so that they can call up users or customers so that they can just basically sing praises of your product and they will question them the right way. So all of those ingredients have to be in place for you to have conviction, first of all, that this is the right thing to do at the right time. And then all of that just translates into a much easier conversation with investors. And you just, I think Ed mentioned this as well, you just save yourself a lot of time and save the time for the person you're talking to as well. If you just go very well prepared with all of that, just do the number one thing is do not rush it. It should really be the last thing you do. It should also, you can also bring a lot of value in that process because in addition to them calling three of your customers, you want to ask them for three prospects. So if they're bringing you prospects and you can close those prospects, now they're going to be interested in investing. If you can't close their prospects, they may not invest. But uh, if they can bring you prospects, that's huge value. And that really validates having them as a stakeholder and investor that they're already helping you grow your business right from the outset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, this is actually so interesting. It makes me think about the, even the, the topic of tonight. So how to pitch an angel and VCs. 
But in many ways, what we're actually getting to is a deeper conversation around when and how do you get ready to pitch? You know, we can, you can go online and find great pitch decks, but it's really about getting ready. And what do you have to demonstrate already in the work you've done? Are you putting in your own capital? I mean, are you putting in, have you put enough sweat equity? Are you taking out a second mortgage on your home? You know, I mean, these are the kind of commitments that, well, seriously, it's the kind of commitments that investors are going to want to see. Are you in this thing and demonstrating that you are ready to weather the storm and put the time and effort in? And then the other side of it is this, how much you really can get from good VC relationships and good investor relationships. I mean, I know a conversation that's coming up in the next couple of weeks with Peter Clark from Excel and with Will Sanders, and they're talking about, about talent. Um, and so, you know, Peter just works for Excel. All he does for Excel Partner is help their portfolio companies find talent. Um, the other side Ed just mentioned, finding customers. I mean, customer discovery is, can be costs, costs of, you know, cost, cost of customer acquisition costs. And if you can get, uh, you know, your investors to open doors for you, wow, they are really bringing value way above just the capital they're deploying with you. Um, okay, so I've got some other questions here. Um, and see, do investors share why or why not they choose to invest in your venture? And should failure to get investors to take to be investors to invest in you be taken as a sign? to stir things up in one's product, I guess really to pivot. Um, but I think, let me ask Ed about the first question. I know you've been talking about in your own work about radical transparency, but do investors typically tell, tell startups why they've invested or not? No, no, in fact, it's best practice not to tell them. In the industry, your, your coach never tell a startup why you didn't invest in particular. Best to ghost them, that's what the lawyers say. Now, it's pretty nasty. Don't be surprised. Uh, now, that's old school. New school is, no, you have to engage them and help them as much as possible in advance of investing in them and really add a lot of value as much as possible. And, you know, you see a lot of guys really leaning into the education and coaching. And, and that's the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and I'm kind of with you, Carl, on that end of the spectrum. I think you should be as transparent as possible. Um, often your understanding might be wrong. Uh, you know, it's so often we, we misunderstand a pitch, you know, if we're only spending 10, 30, 60 minutes with a pitch, it's not hard to misunderstand things and come to a wrong conclusion. Well, if you don't share the reason you say no, you could easily be wrong about it and not get corrected and lose a real, a really good opportunity. So I, I think there's value and transparency that people don't realize. There's also liability. And I think this is why they try to choose not to, because now they're going to try to shoot down whatever reason you said no about, and uh, maybe even try to sue you over it because they thought you were wrong or you slandered them or something. So there, there's a delicate balance to be struck there. And uh, we'll see how we can do that. It's kind of like an HR, you know, you wish you could tell people, give, you're coached by lawyers not to give true feedback and just, you know, uh, eliminate their position, right? <laughs> but you're coached by leadership coaches to give them very authentic feedback. Exactly. Until the point that you fire them. <laughs> so the feedback should have been coming for months or years prior to that, not at the time of termination, right? Yeah, but I think that it's important to note that when you're pitching VCs in particular, don't be surprised if you don't hear back uh, and that you don't hear any information from them and don't take it personally. This is- And this sometimes it's not a no. VCs are famous for, for, for wanting to, to hear because they kind of like you a little bit. You're just not far enough along. You didn't hit their metrics yet. They can't take you to the investment committee with a straight face because your numbers aren't quite right. But you might get there next month, next quarter, and, and they don't want to send you to the next guy either because he might invest and then they'd miss their chance. So actually asking for uh, one investor to refer you to another if they have not invested is pretty challenging. So it's, you got to make your own lists. There, there's a question that just came up that was really great. It's directly tied to this is, you know, if, if someone hasn't given you a yes and maybe they've given you a soft no, is it okay to keep them in the loop? as you progress. And I'm just gonna kind of answer for the, the group. I think it's it's a great thing to do, you know, keep until they say no, right? Don't tell me. Don't, Put them on don't, the mailing list. Put them on the mailing list, right? You know, if they opt out and unsubscribe, okay, fine, leave them alone. But 
you know, often they'll be curious. And one of the things you have that they, that they really want is, is belonging, belonging to something cool, to something world changing, to something meaningful, you know, having money in the bank is not very meaningful, but having a piece of some world changing technology company, and you can really have some fun at the cocktail party with that, even if you only invested $25,000. Right. And, and also, I think, go ahead, go to Eleanor. Absolutely. No, I, I was just going to add that um, the don't don't even just update your investors, update all your stakeholders, update your investors, update the people that you've talked to in your customer interviews, update your advisors, your mentors, update everyone, because that kind of regular contact where people are seeing that is, is a demonstration of that grit and that that purpose and that coachability. You're, you're sharing your progress and then people know what you're doing and they know where they can maybe plug in. They know where they can refer you to one of their cousin's friends or to a, a customer that they just brought in that they think might be a really good fit for your business. Or even they see that you hit a milestone like what Ed said, and they're ready to invest now because now they can see that, that's, that those are the good numbers, the ones that they're looking for. So definitely do a monthly, a quarterly update at the, at the very least, and make sure that you are keeping in touch with all of these people. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna, we're going to address some more questions in a second, but I want to do our, um, a little uh, speed round we had talked about and kind of lightning round. Um, so here's the prompt. What's one piece of advice you want to give the founders in our audience as they prepare, think about going to pitch to angels and VCs? I'm going to start with you, Vikram. Um, I think for, for me, it's going back to what I said before, where the one piece of advice is, before you go and talk to anybody and asking for capital, have leverage, right? Because you have to, and you should know what you're trying to do and who you're going to. And the reason I say have leverage is because um, that also means that it, you're trying to make sure that that's the last thing that you do. So you have your team ready, you have your, your you, you know why you're doing this, you know who you're doing this with, you know what you're building and how you're gonna build this. And maybe you have a product already, you have some customers and users on speed dial, um, and then you go in and their other reason for leverage is because there are going to be, it's a negotiation, just like most other things in building a business is a negotiation. And so you want to have as much leverage as possible to be able to negotiate the right terms for your business. Because again, it's such a long-term game that you don't want to get diluted too early. Hmm. All right, Ed, how about you? Can I have two? Of course you can. It's lightning round, but go fast. Two. All right. The first one is uh, just to, to play on what Vikram said is be able to say no, right? If you get, if you're looking for money and some investor says, oh yeah, I'll give you money, but on this, these punitive terms, you really want to be able to say no. It really messes it up if you can't say no at that point. So, it, so that's, and that goes to, to the point about have customers, have revenue, have at least a little bit of cash flow to survive even if it's on consulting or grants or something that you can continue to build your story until the investors get, get interested. The second one is be inspirational and don't keep it secret. Don't ask everyone you talk to about an NDA and keep it secret. You have to go tell everybody and spread your idea around the world. And then uh, people will respond to it and help you improve it and help you find how it will most effectively engage the world. So don't keep it secret, make it inspirational. Awesome. I love that. Yeah, a lot of folks, it's interesting, a lot of startups still think that I, I, I need to share, again, you need to put this NDA, you know, out there before I'm going to share with you what's going on. And, you know, no investor is going to sign that NDA. So it's just, just stop there. You have to be prepared to be the first to market. And granted, if there's IP issues, don't disclose anything. You don't want to disclose at that level. But if you can't have a conversation um, without, there's no way you're going to have have a conversation, your first conversation with an investor with an NDA as a requirement. Eleanor, how about you? Uh, for the lightning round, I would just say um, start building relationships now and don't ask for money as the first thing that, um, that you ask for. Start getting to know people, get to understand what their parameters are and, and understand when it would be a good time to, to chat with them in the future. And then also just start getting feedback on your, on your pitch pitch your mentors, pitch the people that, that you trust and get their feedback, because I guarantee you the questions that they're gonna ask are gonna be the same questions that the investors are gonna ask and you wanna be prepared with those answers. Awesome. All right, we've got a lot of great questions. By the way, fantastic answers. 
it has been so awesome having this conversation with the three of you. So thank you. And we're going to now turn to the audience for some more questions in the last uh, 15 minutes we've got here. So a question, a lot of these questions are anonymous, but the ones with names on them, I'm going to give them some kudos. So um, Alex Gal um, Galatic asked, how much coaching of founders by an investor board member is the right amount? And I, I guess I kind of asked the question is, do you even want to be coached by a board member? Um, or do you want to find coaches outside of your board? What are some thoughts uh, from the audience here, from the group? About coaching, being coached by uh, a board member. Well, I think you're going to get that one, whether you're looking for it or not. Right. Um, that's part of picking them carefully is pick somebody who you're going to be happy to hear from. Mm -hmm. um, whatever regard that might be yeah, yeah I was, go ahead Elmer. i was just gonna say i would i would second that and say that um your your relationship with your investors and your board members is going to be different from the kind of relationship that you would have with a coach um they just they are they own part of your company they are both aligned with you and also in a way your boss um so having a coach, someone who you can go to when you're like, the whole sky is falling down and I don't know what to do. It can be really, really helpful, especially if you don't have that kind of relationship with the investors that you have on your board. Yeah, the, the, the one other thing I'll add is that I completely agree with Ed and Eleanor on this, uh, but also have advisors. And one of the first few things we did was we had more advisors in our company than employees because we just needed them on our side and they're experts in different domains. And they're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, uh, but it, it, it's been it's been great because, like Eleanor said, you can't always go to your board members. It's a different relationship. Uh, but if you choose them well, then they they are also great coaches. And I mean, that's that's the ideal that we sh that we should all strive for. Yeah, and there is uh, an an important and valuable role of simply coach, executive coach, that sometimes no one on your advisory board or board of directors can can play and it's a uh, it's about being you know being on your side and asking you tough questions regardless of whether you're being challenged by your board or your customers or your peers or your employees somebody who's just you can really trust them to be on your side at all times that's the true connection to a coach you can you can get that hopefully you have at least one it's most people don't even have one of those and uh if you can get it on your advisory board, that's fantastic. But there's a lot of them out there. They come in many flavors. Worth looking for. Thanks, Ed. Uh, next question, Tyler York asks, beyond the basic segments, uh, segment fit, you know, consumer versus enterprise, market segment, type of fund, what is the most important, what is most important while evaluating VCs? What are our thoughts about that? Beaker, I see you nodding your head a little, head a little bit. Where yeah, <laughs> I feel like the one thing missing here is, I mean, it's it's like it's it, maybe this is clinical, but it's like any other job, right? Um, you're you're a venture capitalist. You're it's a job. So how many years of experience do you have in this job? How much have you seen before? Talk to the get references for that person. Ask them for references. The best VCs will give you references of founders, especially the ones where things have not gone gone well. Uh, most mm -hmm. companies fold. Talk to those founders. How was that experience? Um, that's super important. Get references, um, and and going with new VCs is risky, especially if they've been operators before. They will start micromanaging, most likely on the product side or engineering side or something else. Um, so there's a big difference between the ones who are very experienced and have done it for a while um, versus the ones who are, who are who are new um, and and might tend to micromanage. It's a powerful answer. Ed, what are your thoughts on that? I saw you chiming in. Yeah, I, I think that's right. You do want to talk to some other CEOs out of their portfolio. And in particular, you always want to learn how people fight when things get tough. You know, when, when you're running out of money and they think it's your fault, what's it going to be like, right? That will be an interesting question. So uh, another important thing, though, it's easy to overlook is what's their time frame? What's their vintage? If they just, their brand new fund, they'll have eight, nine, 10 years of patience before their 10 year fund clock times out. 
its funds have only 10 years to send the money back to their LPs. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the older the fund is, the closer to that 10 year window there is, they probably ask for a, a, you know, a put a bit, an ability to sell the shares back to the company in five years if needed at, at, their, at their option. And that's not very founder friendly, but they might need that for their fund. Mm -hmm. And so kind of knowing that vintage and how much patience they're likely to have for you to get to your exit is another important thing that's easy to overlook. And I'm just going to ask you to uh, to give us the title of a book that I think you've recommended to me. That's like the Bible on how venture capital works, because just what you say, that nuance of you know, how long are these funds last? Who's actually investing behind? Who's behind these? Who are LPs? And then I think you've got it maybe on your bookshelf up there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it'd be it'd be this one. Brad Feld's Venture Deals. Be smarter yeah. than your lawyer. And none of us, none of us here, you know, get royalties from that, but buy the book or share it with each other because it's a great, great reference. Okay, some more questions here, and then we've just got a few more minutes. Um, so, how critical is it for founders to be on Twitter to build relationships, given the VC world lives there? All right, what do people think about that? I, I'm not on Twitter. Uh, there we go. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I tweet a little. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, let's see here. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. So as, as a CMU alum, what are some resources you used or wished you used or wished you had access to if you could have used them before um, when you were a student? What's out there right now that people should be tapping into that maybe they're not familiar with? In the CMU ecosystem? Yeah, the CMU, yeah, CMU alumni resources, I think. Okay, okay. I'll just, I'll just throw out there that, you know, Venture Bridge is a program that's available for any alum. And, you know, there's some pretty good investment, I think 25K that comes in just for the summer. And then you're, you're, you're put in front of, you know, on, on demo day and some, in front of some pretty big investors that come for that. It's one great program. Um, yeah, that's just one I want to throw out. I, and and on, the, on the investor side, those of you who want at some point to kind of dabble in that space, Ed was talking about uh, syndicates for angels and 99 tartans is something you can also learn from. If you're looking for investors, talk, see if you can reach out to 99 tartans because there, if you're looking for early investment, um, you get a CMU alum that is an accredited investor who's part of 99 tartans. They can sponsor you into the syndicate. Um, and, and get you pitched in front of them. So that's an interesting place to go. And your loyal alum are kind of, you know, looking to, to share the wealth with each other and look for investment opportunities. There, there was a question here that's a little bit trickier for um, when you're building a company where you're just going to be pre-revenue and you have to you raise the money, you just have to be pre-revenue. So, you know, you're in, uh, in a tech space, in a hardware space. Um, how do you raise money before you earn any, before you have any revenue? If you know VCs are asking for that, what do you need to do to convince them to come along for your journey? Don't go to VCs. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to suggest um, either crowdfunding or getting grants um, are both really good routes if you need the capital. Um, but if you if you can do it without the capital, you're like hack something together. I knew a, a hardware founder who. Um, basically went to an electronic store, pulled a lot of like pre-done items off the shelves and then like glued them together. And that was what like, that's what they were selling. And that Prototype. was awesome. that like that worked and they didn't need half, half a million, a million dollars to go to the factory and, and make it. They just, they made it and they sold it and that was it. There, there's another answer. Well, I don't know, Vikram might have an answer and let him go first. Oh, just uh, really quick. I mean, it, I'm not sure if the question is alluding to actually having paying customers because having paying customers comes right, it's, it's long down the road. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like the first step is just have, have, if it's a technology company, it's, it becomes so cheap to build an app or a product or some kind of a prototype. That's just the first thing you should do because you probably have some builders in your group. Just do that and go to company, go to users, get feedback, if, know your community. And yeah, like if it's a machine learning community, they will want to help you if you're trying to help them and just get as much feedback as you possibly can you'll find some evangelists amongst those people 
and make those people your champions and then have enough of those champions and then and then go to then go to VC. I don't think revenue comes much later. It's like these days it's like seed or series A. Uh, so that's I wouldn't I wouldn't put that as the hindrance. What are some ways to get in front of investors? If you're just starting out, someone asked this question, if you think you're ready, how do you find them? Um, and is it always through referrals? And I know I definitely, referrals are one strong way, but if you, you don't have that network maybe to start with, where do you find investors to talk to? Billboards? <laughs> oh no. Uh, you know, really this is where your purpose comes in most handy is to be able to go to networks of people who share your purpose and the five or 10% of them that are accredited will seek you out or you'll find out who they are. You can go seek the leaders in those communities, the guys that retired, the, the folks that you know had an exit that you've seen be successful uh, and, and that have alignment in your belief. And they may not invest right away you probably need to build a relationship with them. But if you keep them up to date, run into them in a few key places, especially where that those places build credibility, like events related to that purpose, then they're going to start to believe in you. And, and pretty soon in a few months, you'll have individuals stroking your checks. And just to add, this is a shameless plug, but we're going to be launching in a couple of months, a product that will ideally help people match entrepreneur to investor. And I'll throw the link in there if folks want to give us feedback on, on, on our beta for that. Great. Thanks, Eleanor. Okay. Just a, this is a little bit of a technical, com technical question here. Someone heard us, I think heard you, Ed, mention grants. How do you get grants? Where do they come from? Um, you know, first of all, let me just do a little disclosure. I never got a grant. <laughs> okay. So I don't know. But a lot of my portfolio guys got portfolio companies got a lot of grants um, and they come. There's many, many billions of dollars of grants out there. They come in many shapes and sizes. Uh, the, the big ones are government grants, NIH and NSF both issue billions of grants every year, uh, typically related to academia. So if you're in the university, you can you know, work with a, a, a PI and go after a grant, usually uh, grant providers have relationships with researchers in this industry. So going into these places cold can be pretty challenging. Um, mm -hmm. Now that said, the world is, a, is, is, is dynamic, right? And there are new grant makers that pop up all the time with new ideas about how they want to give things away and how, what they want to see the change, what change in the world they want to see. And if you see one of these new ones, it seems kind of aligned. Those are the ones to jump on because they don't have so much competition and sclerosis from the past. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention just, we didn't talk about accelerators and incubators. Clearly that's a big space out there for early stage funding and experts and coaches and networks. So, you know, the Venture Rich program is, an, is such an accelerator. Obviously the Y Combinator world, the Techstar world, those are all great places to plug into if you can and encourage you folks to explore that if you're looking to start a company. There are a couple other questions, but I think we've pretty much wrapped at time here. KP, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I think you may have some announcements before we wrap up and just thank you for the opportunity. Vikram, thank you. Eleanor, Ed, it's been a privilege to be with you tonight. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, first, I would like to thank everyone in the panelists, including Carl, for being here. It was uh, really wonderful for our audience as they got, I think, most, if not all, of their questions answered. And this has been a remarkable uh, feat for any of our past events. So really a great uh, panel discussion that we had followed by the Q&A. And then the other thing I wanted to uh, quickly talk about is the startup school event that we have next week. I think Carl had mentioned that. Uh, it's on early hiring and finding your co-founders. So that's the one that's happening next week. Look out for that. And we would want to see you there as well. And with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining this event and uh, be, be in touch for future events as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, KP. Appreciate it. Have a great night. Thank you. Ed, take care. 
Bye-bye.